Okay. Well, good morning um, and welcome to everybody to who has joined us here in the room at American University Washington Center, um, Washington College of Law or on Zoom um, for the second day of our conference on the care infrastructure from promise to reality. Um, I am very happy to welcome you all. Before we jump into our session on expanding childcare beyond the usual hours, um, just a couple of um, tech and Zoom logistics. Oh, I'm holding, I'm holding it. And ah, there it goes, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, the, we would be, grateful or we think it would be fantastic if people wanted to tweet about um, the webinar and we're using the hashtag um, care infrastructure 2022 the webinar will be recorded and we will share all slides eventually they will be available um, on our website and we're going to email the links to anybody who registered um, if you have questions we would love for people to participate please put that into the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen um, and say what your organization is so that we can introduce you properly. Um, but uh, it would also be great if you want to use the chat function to introduce yourself to others at the conference or just share thoughts and um, you know, information. And then um, lastly, um, there is closed caption should be available um, and there is a closed should be a closed caption button at the bottom of your zoom screen. So am I holding this the right direction? Yes. Okay, so to jump straight into the webinar, um, my name is Ariane Hegevich. Um, I'm a senior research fellow at the Institute for Women's Policy Research. And one of the great things um, about organizing a conference is that you can put all your heroes and the people you want to hear from on a panel and they have to talk to you and to each other. <laughs> um, so just uh, a little bit about the thoughts behind this um, workshop. Yesterday, we ended the conference with a um, session on um, building the childcare infrastructure, which highlighted the general research and policy needs um, for childcare, particularly it was particularly focused on early years and the impact on poverty reduction, on intergenerational progress and wealth, on tackling racial inequities, um, and we also started to discuss what's going on in Congress and in the States. This workshop today is kind of much more specific. It picks up one um, area of childcare, um, uh, which uh, it picks up a couple of areas, but which kind of sometimes fall out of the general policy framework. And so what we're trying to do is to ask three questions. And so they're interrelated in a way. The first one is what is the role for employer supported childcare? Um, and what are unions doing to put this forward? The <clears throat> second question is how can we expand childcare provision beyond the usual hours? There are lots of women and men who have to work early in the morning uh, or. Um, late at night or at the weekend when schools and center care mostly are closed, the kind of formal session. So that supplementary role is always there. And then the third question, which I guess is always with us, the um, people who are providing that type of child care, how can we ensure that they earn a living wage and that their work is valued um, as it should be? So with this introduction, um, specifically to who we have on our remote and in-person panel today, um, we're going to start 
with um, Eko Strader, who's an um, associate professor at George Washington uh, University. Assistant, <laughs> assistant professor, right. a professor, whatever. <laughs> He's doing very good stuff at, um, at George Washington University here in DC. And she's going to talk about military childcare, um, which I don't know, maybe those of you who are online, but in many ways, this is the gold standard of employer provided childcare. Um, and then if anybody has any clarifying questions, put them in the chat. We allow a couple of clarifying questions after that. Then afterwards, we are going to um, look at what unions have been doing or are doing to push um, child care uh, for their members. And I'm really pleased um, at the two speakers we have. Um, Debbie King used to um, be at um, SEIU and she set up the um, 1199 SEIU um, uh, child care fund. Um, and is, she's now at the National Domestic Workers Alliance. And SEIU in New York has worked particularly with um, workers in healthcare or this childcare fund who have to work all hours, but who are mainly women, right? So there it's very women focused um, effort. And then um, turn to uh, Liz Skidmore, who is a carpenter by trade and um, a um, business agent or union official for the North Atlantic States Regional Council of Carpenters and also um, the policy group on tradeswomen's issues in um, Massachusetts. And she is going to talk about um, a project that carpenters together with some allies are setting up to provide child care at the early morning hours um, for their members, a pilot project. And of course, you know, the, the carpenters and the building trades unions are a very male dominated union. So really coming at this from both sides. And again, if there are any kind of questions, clarifying questions at that stage, we'll take them, but we want to have the discussion all together at the end. And then we're going to focus more on the provider side and also on the policy side with, um, for, with um, Alexandra Patterson, who is the director of policy and strategy at Home Group, a group that works particularly with um, in-home childcare providers. Uh, and then following that, so long session, lots <laughs> to hear, um, will be Becky Levin, who um, does um, legislative work for AXME, um, and Jaya Chatterjee, who works at Community Change, who a, who a group, and she will say more about them, but who are trying to bring together both um, low-income parents and low-income providers and um, both of them very much focused on pushing for change and mobilizing for change. So it's quite a long, um, long list of speakers, but I hope um, that you get stuff to take away from it. And we are, Liz has, you know, we're hoping to, to learn from this, but also to think what we can do action wise to push um, more provision of childcare. So without further ado, I'm now going to um, pass over to Eko. Um, can we, Eko? <laughs> which, which one? Oh, yeah, no. this one. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So. Um, thank you so much for Ariane and uh, either of you here for including me in this important discussion. Uh, again, my name is Eko Strader. I'm an assistant professor of public policy and women's gender and sexuality studies at the George Washington University. Um, quickly, I have a PhD in sociology and my primary research uh, interests are gender inequality and welfare states. I specialize in comparative analysis, looking at work family policies across different countries and different states. But alongside, I've been studying about the US military because they provide a generous work family uh, support. So with that said, um, let me begin my presentation by quoting a former uh, economics reporter for the New York Times. Uh, she said this back in 1997, that the best chance a family has to be guaranteed affordable and high quality care in this country is to join the military. 
as uh, many of us here are aware, the United States lags behind uh, many other, you know, industrialized nations in terms of work family support. But the Department of Defense sees child care as an essential aspect of a personnel readiness and operational effectiveness. And then this one. So for those of you who may not be familiar about the military, uh, let me provide a brief background on how they, you know, became to operate nation's best and largest child care program. So the child care debate is stalling in Congress, but the U.S. government did pass the Lanham Act during World War II and it funded the construction and operation of a child care for children ages 0 to 12 as part of a war effort. Although the funds were withdrawn after the war ended, as uh, women, you know, left the labor force and returned home, uh, it is important to recognize this precedent for, you know, policy debate reasons. And then dramatic change happened when the United States ended the draft and transitioned to the old volunteer force in 1973, uh, which meant that the new recruits won't be limited to young single men. So to stay competitive against other sectors uh, you know, and to attract high quality applicants, DOD began developing family support programs you know, throughout the 1970s and 1980s, including construction and operation of child care centers. However, it was a shaky start. Um, many military families complained about the quality and an availability of child care. And in 1985, Congress passed the Military Family Act to coordinate various uh, DOD programs to better serve military families. But military child care services came under serious scrutiny in the late 1980s, which eventually led to the enactment of the Military Child Care Act to improve the quality and the availability. Then come to now. So since then, military has gradually developed a comprehensive system of child care. The primary child care providers are called CDCs, um, and they serve children ages six weeks to five, uh, five years. Military service members can receive 12 hours of subsidized care, which comes down to about $90 a week for families making $50,000 a year in fiscal year uh, 2019. At the higher end, families earning like $140,000 a year or more were paying about $150 per week for full-time childcare. Um, you know, because of long and often irregular work hours in the military, in 2016, then Secretary of Defense Ashton Carter told the CDCs to extend hours of operation from 12 to 14 hours per day. But a report compiled by DOD indicates that in 2016, they're only able to accommodate about 78% of the demand for CDC services, which is still an impressive number, uh, you know, given the child care crisis continues elsewhere in this country. Um, because they have not been able to provide child cares for all eligible families, they do prioritize some parents over others. But what I think is interesting, you know, especially after the experience with this pandemic, is that the day um, they prioritize child care development program staff. They are, they are prioritized above all and in single or dual active duty members, not by military rank or pay grade, you know. And then alongside FCCs provide certified home-based services and offer additional flexibility to working parents. Importantly, uh, many of them offer, um, many of them extended in weekend care and then some of them also allow drop-in care overnight care and to take care of sick children. Yeah, I know. <laughs> this is possible because many care providers are military spouses who understand the work demands of the military, but it is important to also know that the FCCs are capped at six children. That's how they offer flexibility and they're certified. But anyway, in 2019, we had about 630 CDCs all over the nation and then 970 certified uh, FCCs. And together they served about 200,000 children ages zero to 12. Yeah, and then, you know, I introduced this as a, you know, childcare system. So in addition to CDCs and FCCs, they also have a school aged care and child and youth services, and they provide uh, before and after school care. So what DOD has accomplished over the last several decades demonstrate that, you know, both the importance of a public-private partnership and then the government's ability 
to provide a quality childcare. Um, legal. Got it. So I don't want to paint an overly rosy picture because military families still face work family challenges. But I want policymakers and employers to know that you know we have a great model for providing and expanding childcare in the United States. First, we already appropriate about one point billion, uh, one point two billion dollars annually to run these programs. And second, we know how to provide high quality care. We also have evidence demonstrating the benefits of hiring well-trained childcare workers in relation to child development outcomes. Um, one additional thing that I want to highlight here is that uh, childcare workers are well compensated and uh, they receive comprehensive benefits, including retirement. Uh, you know, just like uh, other employees who work at the respective installation, military childcare system is not only affordable, but also high quality as there are multiple oversight mechanisms in place, including parent oversight board. Um, and in my own research, I'm finding evidence that comprehensive childcare support provided by the military may be paying off. So I'm kind of getting into the employer perspective now. So I recently published a paper in Public Administration Review examining uh, work performances of mothers and fathers in the Army using administrative, administrative data that contain all new personnel who joined the Army between 2002 and 2009. I was able to show that women who gave birth while in service were much less likely to leave the army to take care of their families than childless women for work family reasons. Um, because the military is a hyper masculine organization and still make gendered, obviously gendered assumptions about work family conflict. I ended up finding that fathers are more likely to uh, leave separate early to take care of their families and childless men. Nonetheless, in this paper, I was able to demonstrate the mothers are less likely to be terminated for poor performance and that the fathers are more likely to reach the rank of a sergeant than childless soldiers. The main takeaway is that these organizational practices may be paying off in retaining quality personnel. Um, and although mothers are still less likely to reach the rank of a surgeon, which is seen as an important bottleneck for promotion in the military, I am finding evidence that the provision of a universal childcare could reduce the motherhood wage penalty across racial and ethnic lines. I don't know if you can see well, it, I, I hope you can see it, uh, but there's no significant differences in pay ranks between childless women and women with one child in the military. In my model, I have a female soldiers who reported to be non-Hispanic white, non-Hispanic black, Hispanic, and Asian or Asian American. As, as you can see from overlapping whiskers, they are overlapping, <laughs> overlapping whiskers, um, the uh, motherhood wage penalty is negligible even after accounting for you know, relevant factors like education level, time and service, and so on. So again, um, you know, gender still matters as married female soldiers, unfortunately, do face motherhood wage penalty as the graph on the right, I think on the right or new, but shows. But these findings from the military are encouraging for those of us who want to see publicly subsidized childcare become reality in the United States, I hope. So uh, I want to end my presentation by quoting this mission statement from the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Personnel and Readiness. Um, as you can see there, for strategic management of uh, their personnel, they list family support in addition to relevant training and education, as well as world-class healthcare. Please don't get me wrong. Um, I am definitely not advocating for you know, increased militarization. What I want you all to take away from my presentation is that the government and employers can do more as evidenced by the military. Thank you, for, uh, thank you all for your attention and I look forward to hearing from you and then learning from other panelists. I hope that was- Yes, thank you, Eko, <laughs> that, was, um, that was perfect. Uh, we do have this one question um, that we received from uh, Eva Herman. Um, who is asking, 
um, whether you know what led to the decision not to prioritize childcare by rank. So I am not sure. <laughs> that is an interesting question. I wish I knew. I uh, First of all, I'm Japanese. I cannot serve. So I'm not an insider person. <laughs> But I will look into it and it'll let you know <laughs> why. I, I know that the, they don't necessarily see, it, they really did, did not want to make any judgment call about ability to pay. That's why they have a progressive sliding scale. I'm sure that they must be related to inclusivity that, that they are trying to strive for. But I will look into it. <laughs> Thank you. And I think that often when there is workplace childcare, it often is made available in a inclusive manner um, and, and that's part of the benefits that you get from it that there is a kind of mix of different levels of hierarchy. So if there aren't any other questions now then I, I would like to switch gear and to um, turn to Debbie King who as I said is a senior advisor at um, the National Domestic Workers Alliance but used to um, work as 1199 SEIU and set up the child care fund there. So Debbie, over to you. Hi, good morning. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, the experience of 1199 uh, SEIU, but also the collective work of unions in New York and nationally the Service Employees International Union. Uh, my involvement started way back in 1989 when I was executive vice president for collective bargaining for 1199, which is a large healthcare local in, in New York. Uh, that year in contract negotiations, we proposed a child care fund to be financed by a half a percent of employer contributions. Um, there were a number of factors that contributed to the fact that we were asking for child care because at that time, there was no other union management Taft-Hartley child care fund in the country. One factor was that our membership was 85% women. The second was that I was a key leader in collective bargaining and myself was a mother of young children, understood the challenges, and also as a union leader could help to bring this issue to women activists and say, isn't this something that we need? And then the president of the union, um, who was newly elected and was really looking to do some new things as a new president, uh, was a divorced father who had joint custody of his young son, so was also experiencing child care issues and, and understanding what that was like. Um, we did win from 17 hospitals in 1989 the fund and in 1992 expanded it to the League of Voluntary Hospitals and Homes, which represent almost all of the hospitals and nursing homes in, uh, in New York, and then in later years to more employers. So that at this point, 120,000 workers uh, in 1199 SEIU in New York are covered by the fund, and its income is $25 million a year. Um, the fund provides a wide range of benefits. One of the things that's interesting in terms of our topic today is that 1199 members were interested in the fund providing benefits for babies to teenagers of age 17. You know, I think it is completely right to focus on the needs of zero to three, but it was interesting, and I think this is still true today, that healthcare workers who work on weekends you know, were concerned about what happened to their teenage children um, during that time and also during the summer. So the fund does cover children up to age 17 and has developed a college prep program, a weekend cultural arts program, um, a program to help uh, teenagers prepare to be, to get into nursing uh, programs and a summer camp program specifically targeted to teens. So again, having a union program with a worker voice has developed certain unique programs. Um, other programs that have been developed fairly recently are um, programs during school vacations, uh, which cover children from age three to age 15. Um, 
Traditionally, uh, the fund provides vouchers for both licensed and unlicensed care, and about 50% of the um, vouchers are for informal care, which is basically used for those non-traditional hours. I mean, I think one of the issues is that people are usually neighbors or relative other than the immediate family who are eligible to be reimbursed and therefore are not getting benefits like health benefits or pension benefits or vacation, et cetera. So that other issue that we're addressing isn't not really covered um, by that. Um, however, it's really a full range of programs. Summer camp is a very, very popular program. And uh, in some cases, we're also providing uh, for sleep away camp, which is very helpful for workers who work uh, the second or third shift. Um, the fund also runs a daycare center, which has won all kinds of awards for its quality programs. But one thing is interesting is it is run at a co-site with a, with a training facility, um, at, uh, including with the City University of New York for um, healthcare workers who want to study for advanced degrees to go there in the evening and bring their children who get a hot meal and homework help while the parent is studying. So again, we saw that um, particularly younger women members were hesitant to take advantage of free training be benefits and the opportunity to upgrade because of uh, the situation who was going to be taking care of their children. So this is a uh, mother, mostly mother, mother leaves, goes ahead into her profession and child also is well cared for. And we have a, a similar program on, on weekends. Um, so basically, I think the program has been very, very successful, certainly from the union members viewpoint, but particularly in the early days, employers were saying, well, we were kind of forced to do this. It's not bad, but why are we the only industry that is providing a childcare benefit? Um, at that time, I was a faculty member of the School of Industrial Labor and Relations at Cornell uh, Extension Program in New York. And I used that position to bring people from 10 or 12 unions together to talk about how other unions might try to negotiate a similar uh, benefit. Uh, one thing that was interesting was that all of the people who attended were women, except for two men, one from the Transport Workers Union and the other from the Amalgamated Transport Workers Union, both of whom were widows and had childcare responsibilities and therefore had volunteered from their unions to come. They were interested in this topic. And um, within a, a number of years uh, from the formation of this committee, both of those unions had negotiated childcare benefit also at a half a percent. Um, of payroll, and those uh, funds cover 45,000 workers. Um, other unions were interested in trying, women particularly, leaders in other unions were interested in trying to get a childcare benefit, but there were challenges. One was depending on the age of the membership and the activists, uh, people said, well, childcare versus improving our pensions. Um, or there were many issues about healthcare costs and um, co-pays for workers on healthcare benefits versus this new benefit. So uh, we decided to look at government support for working people paying for childcare as an alternative to collective bargaining. And the New York Union Childcare Coalition was formed um, as a subcommittee of the FFL-CIO Central Labor Council in New York and state Federation and I became the chair of that. And we lobbied and won a program called Facilitated Enrollment, where uh, two AFL-CIO connected organizations help people apply for benefits that are available through the block grant. Um, and uh, so people do not have to take off time for work, et cetera. And we negotiated as part of that agreement that a higher income eligibility uh, level than the social service agencies provide. And that, that program has been uh, successful. It's primarily been used by members of AFSME in the public sector in New York, 1199 and retail workers. Those have been the three biggest groups. But um, as of last year, there were members of um, 13 or 14 different unions who were accessing some benefits and we've gotten 220 
um, million dollars through that program. Unfortunately, the only program like that um, in the United States, and it's been a, a successful uh, program. Um, in terms of collective bargaining in recent years, there has been some uh, advances in the public hospital system in New York with 1199 and with the New York State Nurses Association. And both there, we won both a child care and elder care fund. Again, the first in the country that a fund that does help workers to pay for and get information about um, elder care and two doctors uh, unions um, in the Health and Hospital Corporation also negotiated a child care fund which has about $15 million in income. So in New York City now, we have about $180 million of uh, employer finance benefits for childcare. Um, you know, all of these programs are very successful. And you know, the question about why there has not been more uh, progress through unions is, is really an interesting, uh, interesting question because one of the things that I have seen is if there is leadership pushing for it, we can make uh, advances there. Um, there, ha there has been additional activity on the part, that's it, on the part of unions um, with the pandemic and a number of unions, particularly SEIU locals have negotiated um, pay for childcare during the pandemic. And also a very interesting program where um, in a number of institutions like Kaiser Permanente, um, there is a program that matches people who are looking for childcare with unionized childcare providers. Again, I think a very, very interesting model where people who are providing the care are unionized and are getting the kind of benefits that we're talking about. Um, unfortunately, those programs are basically sunsetting now that uh, the pandemic is uh, receding, but I, anticipate that after people have had those kinds of benefits, that in the next round of bargaining, we may see uh, within uh, SEIU locals that had had those benefits, uh, a demand in collective bargaining that those kind of programs be, um, be reinstated. So um, interesting to see what's happening and interesting to see uh, with all of the interest in healthcare now in terms of public policy, uh, what role union can play to make sure that the specific demands of their and needs of their members, essential workers and others are, are met in those public programs in addition to collective bargaining. Thanks so much, I've been so happy to be with you today. Thank you so much, um, Debbie, for this. And it's almost the 30th anniversary now of the um, uh, 1199 Childcare Fund. So um, now I pass straight over to Liz Skidmore, who is also going to share slides. And as I said, Liz is a business agent, a union official for the carpenters in um, in Massachusetts or Northeast England. Liz, oh, almost yeah, there, there she is. <laughs> All right, <clears throat> excuse me. Thank you so much for having me, uh, Deborah. I'm so inspired by what you're doing and the scale of it is really incredible. Um, so I'm gonna talk about a slightly smaller scale thing, but we're uh, plugging away, trying to figure it out. Um, so next slide, please. <clears throat> we have uh, a whole group of us that I'll just define in a minute have started a three-year pilot called Care That Works. Um, it's state licensed home-based child care providers. Um, it's specifically uh, focused on opening earlier hours that construction workers need, uh, in particular, trying to help more women get into construction. Um, and then we've tried to prioritize sustainability because for folks, for women entering construction, this, this obstacle of childcare that covers the hours we work um, has been so huge all over the country. And there've been a few times something has been figured out, but then it was never replicated. So we really prioritize sustainability from the beginning. Uh, next slide, please. So just a little bit deeper detail. We started fall of 2020. So obviously COVID has had a big impact. It was not part of our planning. <laughs> uh, 
The licensed home-based childcare providers have agreed to open at five or 5.30 in the morning. Um, all the providers accept subsidies and all our members of SAIU Local 509, which is the union in Massachusetts that represents those folks. Uh, and just sort of for context, private pay ranges from 290 to 400 a week for these providers. Um, I think actually we now have 11 providers in Greater Boston. We're trying to balance uh, getting a number of providers with filling the slots. Um, and then we've raised funds to pull this off from uh, the Carpenters Union and IBW Local 103 in Boston in particular. Um, also a couple grants from the city of Boston, um, some other grants, and then signatory contractors. We've actually gotten negotiated language into project labor agreements, uh, two of them to help fund the program. Uh, interested parents go to our website, carethatworks.org. They fill out an interest form. And then uh, one of our staff people uh, helps connect them with one of the providers. Next slide, please. So just a little sense of who we are. And this is more for, you know, if anybody's trying to think about doing this in their home space, uh, we have had the luxury of this wonderful group, Community Labor United, that's um, very good at pulling together uh, solutions to big complicated issues. Uh, carpenters, the hotel workers who also need um, non-standard hours have been active um, and IBW. Then unions for the providers have been SEIU and AFSCME have been part of the coalition. We have a couple of pre-apprenticeship programs that are part of it. Uh, and then a pipeline effort. We, there's a lot of work to pull more women into the trades and basically we promote the childcare uh, pilot at, at all of those events. Um, and then we've also had the input of a, um, some neighborhood community organizing groups and a, a really incredible uh, shelter for mothers with children um, who've helped us learn more about the system and what's actually needed and kind of from the ground as a provider point of view. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so the vision we have, this pilot is part of a larger effort of recognizing that child care, the child care system really isn't working um, and that families have a lot of needs. This particular pilot addresses the non-standard hour part, but the cost and availability and quality, all of those are things that need to be uh, addressed. Um, and also recognizing that these, for most people outside of uh, what Aiko said in the military, these are not good paying jobs. Um, and, you know, the SAU makes them better paying jobs, but they're still, you know, folks that aren't getting paid what they deserve. So part of the, the legislative and regulatory efforts we're making are around better pay and benefits for the providers. Um, and also looking at, you know, the business ownership and wealth building for the providers that these small businesses could provide if things were sort of the, the financial system was a little bit better for them. And then we want it to be a childcare system that's controlled by and accountable to families, workers, and the community, so that it's not just bureaucrats who are making all these decisions. Uh, all right, next slide, please. So just a few of our coalitions. We've done a lot of members. We've done a lot of lobbying. We've done a lot of speaking at hearings, that kind of thing. Just put a little face on it all. Next slide, please. Uh, these are some of our outreach tools. On the left, this is a, a poster that we've gotten up on, um, probably got, I don't know, about 800 posters up, maybe more now on different construction sites around the city, um, trying to let members know. And then we designed the middle and bottom right photo, our uh, postcard that we designed um, that could appear to come from any union. You know, so a, if a union wants to send it to their members, they change the backside so it, it's coming from them, not the coalition. We did a postcard instead of a letter on the theory that most of our membership is male, but perhaps their wives would see the postcard and be sort of interested, sort of have two parents, if it's a two parent household, looking at it. Um, so this we've gotten mailed out to, um, I don't know, probably 10,000 members uh, and we'll continue to do that on a rolling basis. Next slide. 
All right, and then just again, sort of trying to be a little nuts and bolts. I think that's the carpenter in me for anybody else who's trying to think about this. Um, what we have raised money to do, we pay the providers the $700 a month wage differential for um, the early morning care. Um, it's not enough, but it's something to make it a little bit more uh, appealing to them. A little bit of COVID support, air purifiers and masks for some of the providers at the height of COVID. Um, we got funding for a halftime staff person to help us with outreach and matching the families. And then now we have a multi-year grant that's allowed us to hire a full-time person. I think we underestimated the amount of work it took to do the matching. Um, First few years was all in kind contribution by coalition staff members. Um, and then we've raised more money. And um, one of our colleagues said, we've actually raised about $600,000 so far to fund this, but a, a, a drop in the bucket compared to Deborah's 220 million. So we have new, we have new aspirations. Um, next slide, please. So here's our challenge. <clears throat> we built this program, but they haven't come yet. And we've just done an, uh, an evaluation with an outside organization, but honestly, we're still sort of figuring it out. So we've had over 200 families that have filled out an interest form to say, I wanna learn more, but only seven families have put their child in care with the pilot. So why? Our sort of educated guesses are launching it during COVID. A lot of people were home with their kids and not wanting to pay for childcare. Um, the cost is so high that even for families working in union construction, it, it just makes it untenable. And so they figure out other things. Um, we've definitely had some language barriers between providers and families. Um, and one parent put the, moved their child to a childcare center versus the home-based care. So the next things we are trying are um, a six month scholarship. We're sort of st early sorting that out of 100 to $200 a week for 10 union members. See if that makes them the difference. We're really targeting folks just entering the trade. So as an apprentice, you're earning less, you know, lower wages. So hopefully this would help get people get to their next raise and have a little bit more income um, and make it a little bit more affordable. And then, as I mentioned, going from a part-time to full-time staff person. Next slide, please. Uh, and then there's my info, and I've added Lindsay McCluskey's info. Um, she is actually on the call today. She is the chair from Community Labor United who's helped us navigate a lot of this. Thanks so much. Uh, thank you very much, Liz. Um, the, both of these um, were really inspiring and fascinating, and at the opposite end of the spectrum of how much they've been integrated into the bargaining. Um, and just one, we have one question in the um, online from Carol Joyner, who is at um, the family, Carol, where are you? <laughs> family um, work, God, I'm getting it together now. She, and who was very involved also in running the um, 1199 childcare fund in New York um, when, you know, a few years ago. So um, what she would like to know is, Liz, whether you could say a little bit about um, the bargaining aspects or whether um, contractors or employers um, reacted to this and, you know, how, how you're integrating it into how you're making it sustainable also um, through partners or funding? Sure. Um, so the employer part, <clears throat> excuse me, has been through two project labor agreements. So we had um, Suffolk Downs as a major uh, multi-billion dollar project taking an old racetrack, turning it into, you know, thousands and thousands of, of housing and just a whole new community that was essentially um, grassland and a racetrack. Um, and then um, another major, a major high rise, an almost billion dollar high rise in downtown Boston called Winthrop Center. So both of those developers uh, agreed in the project labor agreement when it was negotiated um, to make a contribute, a financial contribution 
to childcare, recognizing that they supported the goals of bringing more women in um, and that childcare is, has been an obstacle uh, for some women. Um, beyond that, we don't uh, have other employer participation, but I, I think and hope that future project labor agreements that sort of become part, part of the almost standard language at the moment in Boston. And I'll, I'll call out to Brian Doherty, the head of the Boston Building Trades Council, um, who's been a strong advocate for this, and Mary Vogel, who's the head of uh, our premier pre-apprenticeship program in Boston, uh, who's also helped, has been in the room negotiating some of these things. And sustainability, honestly, I feel like we're still figuring it out. And I think if, you know, the child care portions of Build Back Better pass, and I think a lot more is going to become possible, but it's something I worry about. Um, and to, to both of you quickly, um, you know, when I talk to independently, basically having these allows women members to become active, to become more involved in the union. Has that been your experience? Um, you know, does it help with building um, union membership? Um, Debbie, do you want to quickly go first? Yeah, um, yes, I think that it, it definitely um, does, you know, get more people involved. I mean, one of the things that's interesting, Carol's uh, here, but uh, the original uh, formulation of the child care fund was that it was employer specific. It wasn't a commingled fund. In other words, each employer's contribution was left at that employer. So it was not a very efficient use of money administratively, but it did get many, many women members involved because it was like, okay, for our particular institution, what, how do we want to spend the money? Um, in later negotiations where we commingled the fund, which was a union objective and made it made much more money available for benefits and less for administration, uh, there's less uh, opportunities for rank and file people to uh, be involved. But obviously having a childcare benefit and that's union associated is very, very good for uh, women saying, yes, the union is paying attention to you know, my, my needs. Um, you know, having said that, I think things are changing in terms of more men um, having childcare responsibilities and um, it being less gender specific but it still is unfortunately a women's issue that in terms of who has the ultimate major responsibility for childcare. And Liz? Well, I would just add the first family that uh, got a child into care was actually a male electrician apprentice. Yeah. And that given that, you know, women make up about 4% of the construction industry, <clears throat> um, that has actually been very helpful. It's been helpful to to pitch it to the, the membership and everything to be like, you know, there's single dads. I was at a union meeting once and I uh, walked up to a guy who had brought his baby to the meeting and said, do you know about this program? And he like almost started crying. He said, you know, I'm, I was going to lose custody of my child because I couldn't provide care. Like I'm going through divorce, going to lose custody, joint custody because I couldn't provide care. This will mean I'll get to have custody. And, you know, so we're all kind of losing it. Um, so I think the co-ed nature of this in my industry is an incredibly important piece, which isn't exactly what you asked. I think in terms of getting involved, it, this has been, I think it's been allowed some women to come into the union to start their apprenticeship. Um, and it's been a really good leadership development tool because we've had female members speaking at the EEC at our state agency uh, hearings, uh, coming to meetings with the head of that agency to talk about this issue. Um, and last week, one of our members was invited by uh, Congresswoman Ayanna Presley to be her virtual guest at the State of the Union. And they used that to raise the issue of the need for childcare and in particular, non-standard hour childcare and article in the Globe, article on T or a, a short piece on TV. So it's really, um, I think, gotten some of our current members who see the importance of this, uh, who are active in our women's committee 
to get much more involved with policy level and political stuff and that's been terrific. Thank you. All right, now next um, we're going to focus a little bit more on the provider side. And I would like to hand over um, to Alexandra Patterson, who is the Director on Policy and Strategy for Homegrown and will say much more about what Homegrown does and what her objectives are there. So Alexandra. Good morning and thank you uh, for the invitation to join this panel. It's been really great to hear so far all of the innovation that's been happening um, around the country. Uh, next slide. Just to tell you a little bit about Homegrown, we are a national funders collaborative and we have 16 member foundations that are listed on this slide. Uh, and our goal is to increase access to quality home-based childcare. Um, our investment strategy is one that is inclusive of both family childcare and family, family friend and neighbor caregivers. And we uh, work to achieve our vision through uh, making investments that uh, look at strategies for removing policy barriers, strengthening home-based childcare practices and business models, along with supporting the growth and recognition of the sector. Next slide. So my colleagues have talked a little bit about the strategies uh, for increasing care during non-traditional hour. I thought it was important to just take a quick pause to provide a little bit of context for uh, the non-traditional hours care issue and look at who's providing that care along with the families that are accessing that type of care. So this slide has some data from the National Survey of ECE from 2015. And it breaks out the care offered by center providers, listed home-based providers, unlisted but paid home-based providers, and unlisted unpaid home-based providers. The three darkest blue bars represent care offered by home-based providers, listed, unlisted, paid, unpaid. In graph one, there is a distribution of care by provider type during evening, weekends, or overnight. And very clearly we see this care is most often available in home-based settings. The other three graphs go on to disaggregate this data by evening, overnight, and weekend care, but even still in all three categories, home-based providers are really providing the bulk of care during non-traditional hours. Next slide. This data is also from NSECE, and again, it just looks at uh, flexible scheduling, so which providers are uh, open to often offer flexible hours for families, as well as flexible payment options. And again, here's, here's where we see that home-based providers are most likely to offer the flexibility that families need. So state policies really vary regarding the resources that are available to in-home providers. But because in-home providers, both listed and unlisted, are filling the non-traditional hours gap, there really are opportunities to refine policy systems to mobilize the resources to providers that are offering the critical care that families need. And we know that home-based providers are, are doing a lot more than um, offering flexibility and affordability. Very often, they're able to respond to the cultural and linguistic needs of families. They offer small group sizes, continuity of care, and even have very strong connections to the families and the communities in which they're embedded. Um, and so we, we heard earlier about the work that union coalitions and employers are doing to close the non-traditional hours gap by partnering with, with home-based providers, but it really is a role for federal and state policymakers as well as early childhood system administrators to play as well. Next slide. So this data is uh, Urban Institute data, and it's their analysis of 2014 to 2018 census data for families with children from zero to six in three states, Connecticut, Oklahoma, and Washington, DC. And their analysis really reveals that adequate care for families working non-traditional hours is also an equity issue. And I think some of the prior presenters have, have touched on that as well. So in all three states where uh, Urban Institute did the analysis, they identified that more than 90% of the families working non-traditional hours were also low income. And half of that group uh, fell below the federal poverty level. 
And similarly, 75% uh, of the families in all three states were black and brown families. So non-traditional care during non-traditional hours really affects all types of families, but the Urban Institute analysis identified that in many communities, the largest population of families working those non-traditional hours and needing non-traditional care are already under-resourced and marginalized. And ACO really talked about how uh, provision of military childcare changed the trajectory of careers for women and, and including black and brown women. Uh, and so uh, we have a real opportunity here to uh, think about not just the issue of um, taking care of children, but also how do we use these strategies to address equity. Next slide. So we all know, and I think uh, we've talked about this probably at nauseum at this point, that the impact of COVID-19 was really um, seismic, that it really changed the culture of employment in the country. And it also changed what families need in terms of the type of care and the flexibility that they need in their care arrangements. Um, we also had a simultaneous racial reckoning, which really um, turned many folks' eyes to equity in American institutions, including care and education. Next slide. So there are lots of um, recommendations that I could go through um, to kind of meet this moment. We've had historic investment in childcare to date, which is really exciting. You know, it includes the CARES investment uh, as well as ARPA funding, which many states are still working to um, deploy and operationalize. Uh, we've also seen state and states and cities rise to the occasion and raise local funds to match the federal investments. And so there are two buckets of real um, work that, that we think uh, can be done to really improve um, access to non-traditional hours care, as well as support and undergird the providers that are delivering that care. So on the reform side, we would really uh, draw emphasis on reforming licensing and QRIS systems um, to ensure that um, we're removing barriers to access for family providers, particularly those who might be multilingual or um, have, have um, some hesitancy about engaging with a public systems. Uh, we also think that there's an opportunity to look at subsidy um, programs and payment mechanisms. We saw New Mexico and Washington DC kind of step out there as vanguards for that work and really um, address compensation in a way that was fairly innovative, but there's certainly room for other states to join them in doing that. Um, and we also think that there are opportunities to leverage other public dollars uh, from other federal programs to home-based providers to complement um, the, the CCDF funding. On the investment side, we would say that it's important to invest in building supply, um, to also define quality and the appropriate supports as well as comprehensive services for home-based providers in a way that is acknowledging their setting and the uniqueness of their setting as compared to center-based locations, as well as to uh, make investments to stabilize their economic well-being and continue to build the evidence and, and understanding of home-based childcare providers. So there are lots of things that um, Homegrown is doing in terms of investment and research in that area. And these are some of the ways that we would recommend um, the increase in federal dollars be used to support home-based providers. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Alexandra. So everybody, please send your questions. Um, at this stage, I'm going to uh, link straight over to um, Becky Levin um, from AxMe to um, take on the, you know, how, how do home-based um, providers fare in the legislative agenda that we have in front of Congress at the moment and what should we be pushing for there? So Becky, over to you. Uh, thank you. Um, and then I think Joy and I are gonna tag team on this so I'll, we can go back and forth. Um, uh, I'm a, a lobbyist with AFSCME. We represent 1.2 million public employees across the country working in state and local government. And we represent about 60,000 child care providers. Most of them are family child care providers, um, almost all women, but some men um, working out of their homes. And these are mostly um, women of color working um, for very low wages. Um, and we have been able to bargain for some improvements, but we still have a long way to go. Um, I'm gonna talk about um, things within kind of a legislative context, which isn't necessarily 
the context of reality. I think we appreciate that there's a disconnect between kind of what policy does and what we would like it uh, to look like. Um, and I'd also like people to keep in mind kind of this question of quality. What is quality in childcare? What does it mean within the context of policy or how is it defined within policy and law? Um, and really like, what do we need in the system and what do parents want? And what does quality mean? I think it means different things to different people. Um, and, and I think that's something we've really been struggling for, with for far too long within the context of childcare, especially family childcare and especially um, non-traditional hours care. Um, Joya, do you wanna introduce yourself briefly? Sure. Thanks, Becky. I'm Joya Chatterjee. I'm the Legislative and Advocacy Director with Community Change and Community Action. Can I go back to the original slide, please? Thank, uh, sorry, the second slide. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk about how we hopefully can build a better child care system. I think we've all heard various reasons why the current system is inadequate. Um, uh, within the legislative context, I think there's a lot, there's too much focus on centers. Um, and until very recently, family child care wasn't even part of the discussion. Um, and, you know, Joy and I have been at the table fighting for family child care to be included in federal legislation for the past 15 years. Um, she's been a great partner. It's been wonderful to work with her. Um, but uh, I would say there's still a lot of people, um, both on the Hill and just generally, who don't even know what family child care is. I think the general recognition is that family... Child care is done in centers, and it's generally available from eight or nine in the morning until five or six at night. Um, and I was pretty shocked to learn um, when I looked up, you know, how many Americans work non-traditional hours that approximately 40% of the American workforce does not work traditional hours. Um, so if, as we learned in Alexandra's slides, I think about 8% of centers offer non-traditional hours care, but 40% of the American workforce needs non-traditional hours care, right? Like what's wrong with the system and why is family child care not a bigger piece of it? And why is it kind of not more respected? Um, and child care just in general, I think has been struggling for recognition and respect and appreciation. Um, within child care, I think family child care, um, especially, license exempt or family friend and neighbor childcare, um, and I'll define that a little later, has really struggled to be recognized as a very important part of this system. Um, and you know, we need to do a better job of making people aware of that. So we have a mixed delivery system. Um, and I think that Build Back Better has done a really good job of incorporating recognition that we need a mixed delivery system for childcare to work for working families. For sure, we need centers. For sure, we need family childcare. Um, I think there's some work to do on you know, how FFN care fits within that context. Um, and what I mean by that is um, FFN care is a segment of childcare, uh, writers working out of their homes, um, often non-traditional hours, some of it may be relative care, um, and they are exempt from state licensing requirements. Um, but for our members and many of these members, they receive funding through the Child Care and Development Block Grant. Um, and because of the requirements, they have to fulfill basic, they have to fulfill some essential um, prerequisites, including basic health and safety training and background checks. So these are not just random people taking care of children. Um, and they may not be licensed through the official state licensing process, um, but they are registered with the state and they are um, regulated. Um, and I think those are really important to recognize in this context. Um, and then where does funding come from? Um, I think you've heard kind of overwhelmingly that there's not enough funding available for childcare. And so most of it is through private pay. Um, we expect parents to pay for childcare. Um, and um, I think everyone has seen um, how the cost of everything has been going up from gas to groceries, um, to um, buying a new car or even buying a used car. The cost of childcare has in increased exorbitantly as well. Um, and it's 
the cost of childcare inflation in, in that sector has, it, it's, it's growing faster even than in the higher ed sector, right? So in California and the housing market. So in California, inflation for childcare is growing faster than inflation for housing in like the craziest housing market in the country. Um, so we really need some help here. Um, and currently what we're dealing with is kind of this patchwork system um, that you've probably heard a bunch about over the past two days. CCDBG, which we just talked about. Head Start, a great program, which has been around for a while, but is like CCDBG is very limited in who can receive it. Um, and funding for these programs is, is completely inadequate. Um, CCDBG only serves one in eight eligible families. And even though more money has been going into the program, we're serving fewer families. Um, and, and these are just band-aids out there. They don't even begin to kind of address the problem. Um, tax credits, I mean, we're talking about middle-class families when we're talking about tax credits. Those, those really don't help kind of working families who are really struggling to make ends meet. Um, and um, state funds, there are state matches that go along with CCDBG, but it's, it's just not enough. Um, so thankfully, um, President Biden and uh, Democrats in Congress came together. They uh, proposed an initiative for childcare and the Build Back Better Act that would ensure that nearly all working families don't have to pay more than 7% of their wages for childcare. Um, it would be a mixed delivery system. Um, it, and, and importantly, it also designates that you have to pay childcare providers a living wage. You can't look at what the going rate is. Um, a lot of CCDBG has operated on these market surveys. Um, we need to pay providers based on what the cost of quality is. Um, and we're gonna talk about what we think quality is um, in a little bit. Build Back Better also mandated that non-traditional hours care had to be included in state quality rating systems ladders. Um, so that was a good thing. Um, uh, Build Back Better though does restrict participation to licensed childcare providers. Um, and we worked really closely with the Hill to uh, provide ins instructions to states that they really need to look closely at their licensing requirements to make sure that there is a reasonable pathway to licensure so that we can get more people into the system. Um, because we have some huge shortfalls and one of them is childcare deserts. More than half of people in this country live in areas where you can't access childcare. Um, even if you have all the money in the world to pay for it, it's, it's nowhere near you. Um, and I think it's also interesting that we measure child care deserts by looking at licensed care. It doesn't even include family, friend, and neighbor and license exempt care. Um, so I think that even goes to show more, right, like how important that piece of the child care system is to ensuring that we have adequate supply um, and that we can adequately meet the needs of working families, which I'm going to talk about in just a minute. Um, there are huge waiting lists. Um, uh, I mean, it, in some states, it's, it's almost like useless to get on the waiting list. You're never going to get there. And um, I think one of the other shortfalls of the system is because some of these licensing requirements are so um, strict and unrealistic, right? In some areas, you know, a lot of providers are renting, right? They can't make improvements to their homes to meet some of these code requirements. Um, so, but they need to work and there's a demand for these services in their, in their communities. So there's an incentive for them to move to the gray market, right? To like go off the grid and to do, provide this care outside of any kind of regulation or oversight. Um, and I, I, I think that would be really unfortunate. So what can unions do? Um, what have we been doing? We've been organizing the care workforce. Um, we have child care unions in uh, New York, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Oregon, and California. Um, in California, we're joint with SEIU and we just won our first contract about a year ago. Um, and uh, we have a lot of members in California. There are 40,000 child care members and the bargaining unit is split between 
um, licensed providers and licensed exempt. And there's some really interesting stuff going on there right now, um, but a lot of it is still in development. So we've been able to bargain for higher wages. Um, during the pandemic, we've been able to bargain for um, paid days off. Um, this doesn't make any sense, but CCDBG says that um, if a child doesn't come to childcare, um, the provider doesn't get paid, even if you know, all of the operating expenses are still there. Um, so um, there was a recognition that because of quarantines and the public health emergency that providers needed to be paid, um, we think for all of those days, but there, were, uh, uh, there was a, a, a bargaining agreement for how many days would be covered. And unfortunately, a lot of providers have already run through those covered days. Um, in New York, we've been able to lobby for um, healthcare benefits, um, and retirement benefits. We've also lobbied for training programs, which I think is really great, right? We are working not just to help our members, but to make the system stronger, to improve quality. Um, so the real benefits to childcare providers unionizing. And then for union members um, in general, um, and some of the previous speakers uh, addressed this, um, right? Like it depends on what our members wanna bargain for at the table as to what's a priority. Um, and I, I, I wish that childcare could be at the top of that, but we've really been struggling, especially in recent years, with just maintaining affordable health care for our members, um, holding on to the pensions that we have for our members. Um, and um, so it's been really hard to break through and, uh, and, and bargain for these other issues, especially you know, really high ticket items like childcare. Um, and I think unions, um, they raise the tide for everyone, right? We, we don't just do this for our members. Um, when we're at the bargaining table, even non-union members get the same benefits that we achieve in the contract. Um, and quite often, uh, 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 collective bargaining sets the standard for uh, legislative action down the road. For example, non-discrimination legislation began in collective bargaining agreements um, decades ago. Um, and then started seeping its way into legislation. Um, so um, we hope that more working family, working um, Americans can join unions. Um, um, so um, that's where we are right now. Um, Joy, is there anything else you wanted to add in this area? Go ahead, Becky. I'll just add on after you finish. Okay. Um, if, um, if we can, if you can um, pull down because we've only got little time left, so maybe. Okay, sure. So the next slide, please. Okay, so what do working families need, right? They need hours covered that they are working, not just nine to five, eight to six. They need flexibility. Um, so maybe they need to come in earlier on some days and later on other days. We don't see that a lot in centers. We do see that in family child care um, and license exempt care. They want to select this. They want to select the setting of their choice. Maybe it's more of a uh, an area that looks like what their home looks like, or there's a language spoken that reflects the language spoken in their home, or there's food served that reflects um, the food that's served in their home. So, and that doesn't always happen uh, in centers. They need reasonable costs. Quite often, um, uh, family child care uh, is more reasonable um, than the cost of care in centers. They want proximity and convenience, um, and they want quality. And this quality issue, I think, has been a real sticker, right? Um, so um, in legislation, sometimes we've had these big arguments about credentials and degrees, right? Is quality determined by a bachelor's degree from a, from a four-year college? Um, I, I don't really think that's necessary. Um, I, I know throughout the conference, there's been a lot of recognition that childcare providers are pretty special people. Um, and I think there are qualities that aren't captured in you know, a college degree. You have to want to do this work. I have a three-year-old. There is no way in the world I could stay home with him all day. I would go absolutely crazy. I am not cut out to be a child care provider. And I am so very grateful for people who are doing this work so that I can go out and do the work that I do. Um, but uh, this is hard work. And I don't think you need to have a bachelor's degree to do this work. And I think we need to be careful that we're setting standards for a very low paid uh, workforce. And hopefully we can raise the wages 
Um, but we need to really balance that out. We need to make sure that we're setting standards that uh, the workforce can meet um, and where uh, compensation is commensurate with what we're asking for from these people. And especially right now, they are under tremendous strain. I mean, you wanna talk about essential workers? Childcare providers have been there throughout the pandemic and especially fa family childcare providers. So many centers closed um, and a lot of centers closed permanently um, because of COVID. Um, and over the past year, we've seen 9,000 childcare centers close and 7,000 uh, licensed childcare programs close. Right, we really need to make sure, like we are in desperate times right now. We need to make sure that legislation um, is, is inclusive. It's making sure that childcare is a field that uh, people can still enter. It's available and it's accessible and um, that childcare is offered during the hours that working families need. Thank you so much. Um, and Jaya, now to our last presenter. To the next slide. Oops. Thank you. Hi, everyone. So I'm going to um, be very brief and I'm going to use the, close out our time together by lifting up some of the voices of our parent and childcare leaders. Um, so first, I want to say a little bit about our organization. Um, again, I'm Joya Chatterjee. I'm the Legislative and Policy Director at Community Change and Community Action. Next slide, please. So Community Change is a national organization that builds the power of low-income people, especially people of color. Childcare is one of our core priorities. Our childcare work is mostly focused in DC and eight states. We work around the country with 36 childcare grassroots organizations, and we also directly organize parents and childcare providers through what we call our Childcare Changemaker Project. And through our childcare work, our goal really is to create space for parents and childcare providers to join together, to strategize together, and build a shared agenda around making childcare universal and affordable and winning living wages and career pathways for the early childhood workforce. Next slide, please. So, as I said, I want to lift up some of the voices of the people that are experiencing some of the things that we've heard about today. First, Aubrey. My name is Aubrey T. I'm a single mother of four living in Reading, Pennsylvania. These past years have been incredibly hard for me. I've been homeless, worked odd hours, and had no support system or childcare at different points. I was working as a home, aid, as a home health aide for a while. As a home health aide, I worked odd hours and struggled with finding childcare after 5 p.m. or early in the morning. This made it hard for me to continue working and providing for my family. While many childcare centers, with many childcare centers closed on weekends, I also struggled because I often had to care for my clients on the weekends. How am I supposed to keep my job if I don't have childcare? How am I supposed to pay for childcare if I don't have a job? This is from Barbara from Georgia. I've been a family childcare provider for 27 years now. And in my small rural area, we need more providers. I'm planning on retiring. And so many family childcare providers have closed due to COVID and being scared. Please help us. Terry from Michigan says, I'm a day daycare provider, but I can't hang on. I can't charge more because parents will not pay it. I'm making the same as I did 30 years ago. I collect no pay. By the time I pay bills and food, there's nothing left. I'm pretty sure I'll be closing next year. I just can't do it with our pay. I can honestly work full time, 40 hours at McDonald's. I would work less hours than I do now and make more. I'm sure of it. So as you can tell from these stories, both parents and providers continue to be in crisis. You can just hear the panic that people are feeling in these stories. They're desperate for solutions. And we've heard a lot of inspiring solutions here today around you know, what unions have been doing to extend, expand benefits in male-dominated industries like the trades and less male-dominated industries like healthcare, um, through bargaining for benefits for the workforce. Um, and we've, you know, sort of heard a lot about promising models like the military childcare that, 
you know, that do have non-standard hour care and work for both parents and providers. And Becky sort of rounded us out, like emphasizing how we need federal investment that works for both parents and child care providers. Right now, we are not doing right by either of them. And we can't keep pitting parents and providers against each other because our resources are limited. And I'm just going to close out by repeating what our first panelist said. The government and employers can do better. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And maybe a round of applause for all of the speakers. Um, so we, we've got about almost 10 minutes for, for questions. And please, if you want to put something in the chat uh, in, uh, or also the um, panelists, you know, raise the hand. Um, I wanted to start with one question. Oh, sorry. Apparently I raised my hand inadvertently. Um, <laughs> they, I wanted to start with one question. You know, we, we kind of, who knows what happens on Congress at, at the moment. What, um, what do we think could be the role of uh, employers? How can we put more pressure on employers to put more funding into the childcare space? Should we do that? And uh, th this work to some extent came out of a study we did um, a few years ago for the uh, World Bank, which looked at models where employers had to provide um, world uh, world workplace childcare or had to contribute into a pot. So, and I know one, there's one legislative proposal up in New York that employers should contribute to into a general childcare fund. But is this the moment we are at the tightest labor market in a very long time? Um, COVID has shown the desperate need for childcare, not that we didn't know it before, but employers have really uh, or many of them have noticed it. Can we, can we um, capitalize on this or what models may there be to do that? So anyone? Um, yeah, Debbie, you just want to? Yes, you know, uh, you refer to there is legislation now in New York State um, from Jessica Ramos from the Labor Committee uh, suggesting a tax on employers uh, to uh, pay for childcare, particularly for children uh, zero to five, but also for after school care. And there's also another um, piece of legislation looking at universal childcare. Um, so, you know, there are some things that are, you know, on the table in, uh, in New York state. I know that the two legislators are presently meeting to see whether or not those two bills can be combined. So I, I don't know whether or not the employer tax will remain. One of the issues in uh, New York State is that there's a lot of federal money now and the state is in pretty positive financial situation. So whether or not immediately there's a need for an employer tax, but I think that there's no question that, um, you know, unless we do get more federal money that in order to meet the childcare needs of people in New York State, uh, an employer tax of uh, companies, this would not be public sector, obviously, companies that have over a certain amount of income um, would be something that, that would be uh, possible. Um, you know, again, in states that have uh, democratic control, could we try to um, model this and see what, what happens? I think the time is, now let's see what happens with Build Back Better, but I do think the time is now. Um, uh, Becky, you were next, and then this. I think employers need to become much more vocal in terms of talking about the public good of investing in childcare and having the government invest adequately in childcare. Um, it will create a more stable workforce. Um, it's good for them. Um, and whether or not they're putting money into the system or not, I think they just need to really join the call in an aggressive way. Um, we've worked a tiny bit with the Chamber of Commerce, um, but I think there's a lot more that they can do. Um, and, you know, there have been some odd partnerships in the past. For example, 
um, labor and the chamber have worked closely on immigration reform. I think this is another area where we really need um, businesses to step up and talk about how essential this investment is for our economy and for the workforce. Um, Liz, and then to give that question back to everybody, what can we do to make employers more vocal or what good examples are, are there? Liz? Uh, just two quick examples. In Western Mass, um, a group of five or six employers that uh, ran manufacturing facilities, including, ironically, Smith & Wesson, uh, got together and supported a 24-hour child care plan uh, in a pretty rural area. Um, it struggled, but it, I think it, they did figure some things out. Uh, the other thing I want to mention is um, in Boston, you know, this is the challenge with legislation is you work like hell to get it passed and then somebody's got to enforce it. So we learned that uh, there had been an ordinance passed requiring developers who built something over a certain size to then provide, to include, either include a childcare center in that building or put money into a fund for child, to support childcare somewhere else. Um, I think only one developer was ever actually required to do this and a couple hundred thousand dollars sat in a bank account for about 18 years till we found it. And that's a piece of the money that we brought to the city's attention uh, as being a place they could perhaps fund a project like ours. And we did get some of it. So I don't believe it's being enforced currently, but it's an interesting model given the issue of, of childcare deserts. Uh, and the need to invest in in more resources for that. Um, thank you for that. On on that issue of state initiatives, I also Alexandra, you mentioned that there are a few states who have interesting initiatives to improve the pay of um, in home care providers. Um, could you perhaps say or say which states, or maybe a couple of things that we could pick up? for other states who are trying to develop similar initiatives? Yes, and emphasis on few, very few, but still uh, worth noting. So New Mexico um, it has just switched over to a cost estimation model for their subsidy payment system. And that really gets at the issue that Becky talked about in terms of using market rates. So states have a choice about how they determine uh, reimbursement rates for the subsidy dollars. And most states, if not all states, are using a market rate, uh, which is problematic because the market rates are based on what parents can afford to pay. And we know they can't afford to pay the true cost of care, right? So New Mexico has sort of taken that bold step to um, conduct a cost estimation model, which includes a number of different factors, um, including um, things about provider demographics, et cetera, et cetera. And they're using that to really determine the rates they use to reimburse for a subsidy. And so, um, um, really, I think that's a it's a bold step, but also it uh, gets at some of the equity issues around how do we adequately compensate folks who are doing this difficult work and uh, providing care during non-traditional hours. And then Washington, D.C. has taken a slightly different approach. Um, they're also uh, using some of their uh, their. Uh, their dollars to do stipends, and then they are also increasing their rates as well. So, um, you know, I think there are definitely approaches uh, to get there. I, I know that folks, many states are uh, worried because the ARPA dollars are, are not forever, but I think there's definitely an opportunity to use the available dollars that are temporary to, to develop a method, right, that can be used to both identify the true cost and then um, to develop some strategies for getting to a place where they can cover the true cost. Thank you. Daya? I just want to um, add on a little bit to what Alexandria said and just note that like when we do talk about these policy wins, like whether we're talking about, you know, um, benefits that union members sort of bargained around over these past couple of years or these New Mexico and DC examples, there was a lot of organizing behind that. There were parents and providers coming together, non-union, non-union, that sort of worked really, really long to make things, things happen. I, I think unless there's somebody else who wants to say something, that is a really good end to this session, that it is about organizing. 
um, but there is more awareness and a basis of what needs to be done. Um, and I also think what is really encouraging is that we, you know, they are, we're not starting from nowhere. There are some good practice examples from different parts of the country and different sectors. And um, hopefully lifting those up will also help inspire people to push for change. And so um, now, thank you so much, everybody who attended this session. I'm kind of going like edgy to, to um, get to the end now because we are shifting to the final plenary for the conference. And we very much hope that you stay on. I think you will have to shift Zoom link, right? You have to shift Zoom link, but that um, happens to be, um, or I hope this will be a really interesting discussion too with the director of the Women's Bureau, with Nancy Fulbray, who is looking more kind of how we think about care also in terms of research, Josie um, Kalipeni and also um, Carolyn Pincus from the Sustainable Business Alliance. So we've got employers, we've got advocates, we've got the government, um, and then we've got research in the final plenary. But thank you so much. And I personally will get back to you to kind of see how we can take this forward. Um, but thank you very much, everybody who, who joined us this morning. Right. Bye.